Hello, I'm uh, John Porter, KK4JP, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the LoRa WAN radio and the Internet of Things. Uh, first of all, I'll start off by saying that this is a, a presentation that builds on an excellent uh, a presentation that Mike McPherson, KQ9P, gave uh, back in 2019, talking about the Internet of Things. Uh, that we're going to be focusing on some slightly different things. So this is, a, is still a good video to check out there. Now, what is the Internet of Things? Well, basically, it's a way of connecting devices instead of people. Uh, those can be sensors, it can be controls, it can be appliances, it can be anything that, that, that is, is not sort of a person. And most of these things are going to be fairly small or they're going to be integrated into other things. Now. Why am I interested in it? Well, I do research over on the Eastern Shore of Virginia and the, um, where you see the two stars there are places that we do research that are out in the lagoons. They're not, they're not on any land. All of the AC power is back on the mainland. Uh, this poses a problem for doing a, a sensing. There's lots of things we'd like to know about the temperature and things like that. Just to give you an idea of sort of what this landscape looks like, here's an oblique view with our lab down in the foreground and the star for one of the places where we're studying seagrass is, is out there. Now, all of this is salt marsh, so once a day that's underwater. Not a good place to put solar panels. Similarly, in the water itself, not a good place to put solar panels. We do get enough wave action here that you couldn't put them on floats or things like that. So power is a, is a big issue there. But we have needs to get data from here back, back to the lab. Right now, we do it by storing data loggers out in the field. But the problem is that if one of them breaks, you don't know about it for maybe until you go out to check it again. And so you get, uh, get gaps in your data. So we'd like to be able to get the data real time. So one potential solution is to use Internet of Things technologies in order to collect that data. We have uh, access to two towers, uh, one uh, sort of in the vicinity of our lab in Oyster, one at the southern end of Hog Island. And I've drawn circles here of, of, uh, of 10 kilometers and 12 kilometers which are around the maximum level distance that you can cover with, uh, with what's called LoRa or long range uh, radio. Uh, so we're gonna spend some time talking about LoRa. It's a digital radio technology. It's it, low, long range, uh, Ra range. That's where, the, where it gets the, the, the name. But long range really only means 16 kilometers or less. And if you're in a city, it might mean 100 meters to three kilometers. It's, it's not necessarily uh, going to punch its way through, uh, through everything there. One of the things about it is that it's characterized by that low signal power. Now, how is it that it's able to do data if it's got such a pitiful signal there? Because we're talking less than 25 milliwatts in terms of the, the signal there. Uh, what it uses is what's called a chirp spread spectrum. You basically, a chirp is basically something that increases in frequency or uh, if you have a down chirp, decreases in frequency over time. So an unmodulated chirp, if we looked at the frequency versus time would be like that. And if we showed it as a, uh, as a graph, it would basically be sort of lower frequency here and higher frequency at the end as, it, as it's going up there. And that would constitute a chirp. The characteristics of chirp spread spectrum is it's uh, resistant to multipath fading. So you don't have some of those issues that you have with HTs of where, you know, sometimes it works badly in one place and then you take a step to the left and it works great. It's resistant to that multipath uh, path fading. Uh, also, if you happen to be in a moving vehicle, it's unaffected by Doppler. Uh, and uh, so, a uh, low raw uses that chirp spread spectrum. If we want to modulate a signal, what we do is it, it may start up and then it drops down and starts up and, and that would indicate a particular signal. And it could actually go up and start down again. There's all, all sorts of variations for the different symbols that you, that you might have. And 
LoRa in the U.S. operates uh, around 915 megahertz, really 902 to 928 uh, megahertz. That's divided up into 64, 125 kilohertz bands and eight 500 kilohertz uh, uh, channels as well. So that's that's LoRa. Here's what a signal would actually look like. Uh, in this case here, what we've got are, are eight uh, up chirps that are basically a preamble that says, hey, something's coming. And then two down chirps to say, okay, get synchronize up, it's starting now. And then, uh, and then finally we have modulated symbols. So these are the ones where it's jumping around a little bit in order to actually convey data there. Now, LoRa uh, devices, the sensors are typically not very expensive. The, the LoRa part of them is usually you know, 20 to $30 at most. And then, and, it, and then they have the sensor associated with it. This is a, a sensor that measures three temperature sensors and it's got a, got a little antenna there and it's weatherproof and so forth. Uh, the key thing is low power requirements, okay? This instrument, they say that if you're operating it, uh, taking data only once an hour or so, probably good for 10 years on the internal battery for sending that data back up to 10, uh, let's say 10 kilometers away. That's really impressive uh, uh, battery life there. Uh, part of that is because it's, uh, it's sending, again, that very weak signal. But the other thing about it is that it's, uh, uh, when it sends the signal, it sends it for only brief time periods. It may, may only send it for a few milliseconds. So the duty cycle is, is super low. So the power required is also super low. Um, they're, uh, they're relatively, they're designed to be relatively easy to add to a network. So let's, let's talk about what we mean when we talk about a low raw WAN, a low raw wide area network. That's what the WAN stands for, is wide area network. Okay, we start off with a bunch of sensors. Okay, this, this is only a subset of all the kinds of sensors that are out there. If you wanna have a sensor that tells you how full your trash can is, which is actually a form of proximity sensor, They've got those, they've got just about everything you can imagine. So you've got these sensors there. Well, they have to talk to something. And the thing they talk to is a low raw WAN gateway. So the gateway is the device that is using low raw to receive data from the, the sensors. Importantly, notice that this proximity sensor is sending data to two different low raw gateways. And in fact, in the real world, you'd actually like to have your sensor send data to as many low raw gateways as you can, because that way you get redundancy. Uh, you don't uh, uh, stand, uh, stand as much of a chance of having a message going missing on you. But that gateway then needs to communicate to a low raw WAN network server. Now, at this point, the links are no longer low raw links. These are actually network links. They're just standard. These could be Wi Fi, they could be wired. Basically, we're talking about going over the internet here. Because the, while these sensors are super low power, these gateways are not necessarily low power. They're usually something that's, that's uh, plugged in. So that low raw WAN network server gets the data that comes from these gateways and does things like check to see if there's any duplicates, duplicates, and if so, eliminates them, does all of that sort of, sort of work and provides a place that stashes that data. Then what we have is an application, the next uh, thing that we have is an application server. Okay, this is something that takes that data that's come from the sensors and then displays it in some attractive way. And it could go on your PC, it could go on a phone, a tablet, it might call 911, uh, it might uh, go to your voice assistant, it might go to your Alexa or, or, uh, uh, e or uh, Echo device. So let's take a look at some of these things. Let's start off with the, uh, with the low raw gateway there. Okay, low raw gateways don't look like much. That pretty much looks probably like every Wi-Fi access point you've ever had in your house. And they're basically doing the same thing, except that the frequency you're receiving here is no longer 2.4 gigahertz or 5.8 gigahertz. It's 915 roughly uh, megahertz. 
Uh, some of them are designed for outside. This is this is one that's designed for outside, and it has a uh, an external antenna that can add some gain to it for getting longer longer ranges. This is also sort of another example of an outside one. Uh, now, one of the things that's important is that just because you have low ROS sensors doesn't mean you have to have a gateway. If there are already existing gateways that are reachable by your uh, your sensor you don't need to have your own gateway. Because one of the things that's different is that you might be driving around town and you need and you pull out your phone and you say, I want to connect to a Wi-Fi network and you see 15 different Wi-Fi networks. But the problem is it doesn't do any good because you don't have the login credentials to use any of those. That's not the case with, with LoRa. With LoRa, any gateway that receives your signal that's, that's connected up to the, the same network as, as you're using, is perfectly happy to take your data and uh, and, uh, and and uh, and and pull it in, and we'll talk a little bit about how uh, how that uh, that works further on. Now, in terms of the uh, there's a again a gazillion gateways out there that you can purchase uh, anywhere in the two hundred uh, to a thousand dollar range. Uh, uh, it tends to be what they they run. Now, and then also you can build your own probably for less than $100 uh, using a Raspberry Pi and, uh, and a low raw board for that. Anyway, network servers. Uh, these are the servers that are taking the data from the gateways. And there's a bunch of them that are out there. This is a, a list of some. We've got Amazon Web Services, IoT Core for low raw WAN. A uh, chirp stack is one that you can actually install on a local computer so that you can essentially run your own network. Uh, one that I've been using for experimentation is the Things Network. It, uh, it tends to have sort of a big development component to it, uh, currently on, on version three. Uh, and then uh, one that's gotten sort of a lot of attention is one called Helium. Uh, and it's one that actually mines cryptocurrency, and we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a second there. But there are these other ones here. To tell you the truth, I have not actually gone through and experimented with all of them and figured out sort of what the, the advantages of each of them might be. Let's take a look at, uh, at where are there, let's start off with things network servers. Okay, there's a, a map of the world, as you can see, there's more things network stuff in Europe than there is in the US. There's also, it's also very heavily used in Japan. There's about a, a roughly 20,000 different existing gateways that are out there. So if you, your sensor happens to be with rain, in range of any of those existing gateways, you don't need to worry about, about having, a, having a gateway at all. The Helium network, uh, this is sort of a, the areas that are in white are places that have uh, things. And as you can see around cities, send, tend to see a lot on the Great Plains, not so much. Um, but they have 192,000 gateways. That's roughly 10 times as many as the Things Network. Uh, looking at sort of the Charlottesville area, they tend to break things up into polygons. And uh, the, the polygon that I've clicked on here in central Charlottesville lists three gateways there. Uh, incidentally, the, the, the three words there are a way of indicating a location. There's a, a website that uh, will, for any location, will tell you the three words that apply to the three meter square you're talking about. So in principle, special concrete frog tells you to within three meters where something's located. Now, one of the things about it, though, is that all of these uh, hexagons may not actually be active right now, because here we've got three of them. One of them was active up to at least within the last two weeks. This one hasn't been active until 11 months ago. This one was two years ago. So, just because there's a, there's a hexagon there doesn't mean there's necessarily some some working. Uh, I'll also well I'll also note here that it says a little thing zero HNT for thirty days and, and each of them has that. I'll we'll talk about that in a second. So why are there so many helium access points relative to the Things Network access points? Uh, 
or, or gateways, so you can call them either way there. Uh, well, basically, uh, Helium has figured out sort of a way of monetizing gateways. So the way it works is that if you are using a sensor to send data back to Helium and it's going to some application, it's being stored on Helium, you have the account that lets you access that data that came from the sensors, well, then you have to pay a certain data, a certain number of what they call data credits for each message that you get back. Well, that means that, that they're getting some money for every time a message comes back. What they then do is they take and then share that money with the people whose gateways that message passed through. So they pay them in a gate in a blockchain-based cryptocurrency. And typically the, the payments are going to be small amounts, but they can add up. If you happen to be in the right spot, uh, you know, you might get uh, you know, $50 a month just by having this little unit sitting in your sitting uh, in your in your building. Now, what we saw for the ones from Charlottesville is in the last 30 days, each one of those had had exactly zero <laughs> uh, units of, uh, of cryptocurrency uh, uh, given for it there. So that's, uh, but that's one of the things that's made Helium very popular is because people would like to be able to, to use it to mine, mine this cryptocurrency. Every time you pass a, a, a message, you get a certain amount of cryptocurrency back. Um, now, if you happen to be in the right spot, and if you've got a good antenna that's got good coverage, and there's lots of devices being used, maybe a shopping center, maybe an office complex, someplace where they're using a lot of these to monitor buildings and things like that, yeah, you might, might actually make some money. If you aren't in a place like that, probably not so much. So the number of devices is sort of going up over time, so it's, it's hard to say. And usually uh, a helium gateway, I would, I was seeing a lot of them in sort of the $550 range. There was a time where you couldn't get them at any cost because they were a real hot item for the cryptocurrency. And so uh, they, there was a real shortage of them. I think we may be sort of getting at the, at the end of that. Anyway, like I say, there, there are charges associated with, uh, with these things for Amazon, uh, uh, IoT Core LoRa WAN charges two dollars and thirty eight for each million messages of five kilobytes or, le or less. A uh, Helium, their their packets are a little bit smaller, and they're one ten thousandth of a dollar per message coming through. Uh, the Things Network operates what they call their Community Edition. It's a, a somewhat limited version that allows you to sort of try it out for free. Uh, and that's uh, that's what I've been using. Uh, I consider doing Helium, but one of the things about Helium is that uh, when you establish a gateway, if you want to move it again later, you need to pay them a ten dollar fee. And I'm doing a lot of experimenting, and so I'm moving the gateway all over the place. So I'm that that wasn't for me at this point. Anyway, uh, this is uh, what uh, the, a test application. Uh, they call an application one of those places that receives data from sensors. I've got four different sensors hooked up to this one. Uh, one of them was received four hours ago. Another one was received 13 minutes ago. It's giving me sort of a little heads up on it. If I want to, I could pull up and look at any particular message that's, uh, that's been received there. But it's a pretty crude interface. It's, it's not, uh, not, it's functional, but it's, it's not, this is certainly not what you want showing up on your cell phone. Now, when a message comes in from a device, it gets put into a message. This is sort of part of a, this is a snippet from, uh, from one of the messages received. Now, the important part from the sensor standpoint is here's all the decoded data. So there's my battery voltage, my uh, humidity, my temperature inside and my temperature outside. There's my decoded data. But since the gateways have plenty of, uh, of power, they, get, they then add a bunch of other data. So they say, what gateway were they? They'll tell you something about how strong the radio signal was. In this case, it was a, a pretty darn strong one. Uh, 
and then uh, and then then they will also tell you what uh, frequency you were using. In this case, uh, 904.9 uh, megahertz, and uh, and the fact that I'm using one of the the 125 kilobit or 125 hertz kilohertz wide uh, a frequency band for it. So that day, that's the sort of data that's sitting there on that uh, LoRa WAN network server. So the next step is we'd like to have something that looks a little better than that. So that's where you then have an application server. And these are a list of companies that do, that have application servers that you can use or you can build your own. Um, so they're sitting there in between the low raw WAN network server and all of the devices that you're interested in. I rigged one up with the My Devices Cayenne uh, application. So this is a device that records the records that temperature and humidity. So here's my humidity, my external temperature, here's uh, my internal temperature graph, how my signal's doing, how my battery's doing. And you can move that around and set it up. It's, it's configurable. So, and what I did was just said, okay, go to the things network server, grab this piece of data, bring it back and, and do this with it. Now, one thing is that uh, there are some issues with low raw when it comes to using it actually on ham radio frequencies. Uh, one of the things is by default, all of these devices are encrypting the data. I talked about the fact that if you're if you were driving around town and you could use anybody's uh, Wi-Fi to, to send email, would you want to be sending it through various people's servers and not encrypting it? where you don't know them and they don't know you? Well, the sensors encrypt. And then at the low raw WAN network uh, uh, level, those the de-encryption codes are stored. So at that point, the data can be extracted. But that's a no-no for ham radio. We don't encrypt. We, we have to have it open and, and clear. The other thing is also, actually, there's no real reason that you would necessarily want to, if you're trying to take advantage of the fact LoRa WAN has all these networks, all these gateways that are already running, well, those aren't running on ham frequencies. Let's face it, they're on the, on the regular frequencies. The other thing is also the, the sensors are not going to be following call sign rules the way they need to, and they're not remote control aircraft, um, and so they, they need to, to have that. Now, there are actually some people that are working with LoRa, not necessarily LoRa WAN, but uh, developing ways to do LoRa on 70 centimeters on, on UHF. So there's the LoRa HAM project that has software for working with an Arduino. There's also specialized hardware. There's something called a HAM Shield LoRa edition that it has a one watt 70 centimeter uh, uh, band uh, board there. Uh, the other thing is also there's nothing to say that you can't use low raw WAN for actually controlling things in your shack. So if you wanted to make it so that you could power down your shack remotely, you could hook up a low raw WAN switch and then any place in the country that you were that was in range of a low raw WAN uh, uh, Gateway, you could then send a signal that would say, "Okay, turn off the turn off the the, the radio, or turn it on, or or whatever." Uh, that could come in handy if you had a low raw WAN, a sensor hooked up to low raw WAN that detected lightning or something like that. Maybe you make it turn off the stuff in the shack. Let your imagination go on what things that you might use it for like that. And there's also been some work on using low raw WAN for for transferring information into the APRS uh, tracking apps and things like that, rather than necessarily using ham radio to send the locations in. So if you decide this is something you'd like to do, uh, it's not, uh, not hard to get, get, uh, get started, especially if you're starting off with sensors, because the sensors, a development board will may might cost you thirty dollars or less. Even a, a, a pre-built sensor is probably not going to cost you more than fifty, except if the sensor itself is very expensive. If you got a sensor that's very highly calibrated and things like that, then yeah. But the low raw part of it is is really cheap. So you know need to figure out what is it you want to do. What sensor would 
or sensor or controller would allow you to do it. Set up a free starter account on one of those uh, uh, low raw win uh, networks, and they all have, for the most part, free starter accounts. Uh, if you and check to see whether or not there's existing gateways you might be able to use. Otherwise, you may actually have to purchase your own gateway. And who knows, you may be trying to mine hel helium cryptocurrency in the near future, uh, realizing that I do not, well, it may be possible to come, become rich from, uh, from mining helium cryptocurrencies, but it isn't common. <laughs> so anyway. So then you uh, you can hook hook up your uh, low raw win network server to some sort of an application server that provides the display, and then uh, and then and then configure that so that you can see it just the way you like. Anyway, it's a, it's an interesting thing. We'll be hearing more about it. The 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 number of sensors is going up and up and up and up and up. At this point, they're if you go on to any of these sites to look to see what sensors are available, it's a long, long list. <laughs> There's lots of duplications and things like that, but nonetheless, it's a, it, it's amazing the amount of things that they are. And, you know, there's lots of places where you might like to know something about what's going on, where there, where electrical power is an issue, where having any sort of a telephone line or anything else to, to transfer the data back is a, is a problem. And uh, LoRa's is sort of a great solution for that due to this low power. Anyway, thank you very much for your uh, for your patience with the the talk there. Uh, go out and enjoy. <laughs>